Blackburn, we'd love you to become members. It's a members club. We have a coffee morning meeting with David White coming up on Tuesday. We have a social club with Steve Webb on Friday. These are the kind of things you can look forward to as members. Um, I would like to briefly acknowledge the help I've had in assembling uh, meetings and running meetings for Stephen Glover of uh, Stephen Glover Enterprises. Uh, thoroughly recommend his conferences. Um, and that, I think, is the housekeeping. If I may, I'll spend about five minutes uh, just explaining a little bit of background to this meeting and why we've convened it. Uh, as I said before, age wage sees uh, value for money as pretty important. Um, we've got uh, value for money in pensions as a means of people taking decisions. So whether you're an individual wanting to bring your pots together or whether you're uh, an employer wishing to consolidate your scheme with another, value for money is the measure which you use to decide whether or not it's a good idea to actually transact. So we've got to get value for money right. Our view is that the best way of looking at value for money is through data. And data is uh, freely available in pensions as a result of us being able to see, if we're fiduciaries, all the contributions that people have paid over time and the outcome of those contributions being their net asset value. If you can compare contributions and the net asset value, you are in a position to do something which is very important, which is to create an internal rate of return for each member. That internal rate of return is unique to that member and can be compared to the average rate of return that the member will receive if they're invested in an average fund. Can we find an average fund which we can compare everyone to? Yes, we can, because Morningstar have published something called the UK Pension Index. What we're doing at Age Wage is comparing the average funds with your particular experience and giving you your result as an age wage score. And we do this for up to uh, um, uh, 500,000 individuals at a time. So far, we've analyzed two and a half million pension pots. And we are clear that the average score of those two and a half million pots is 50. If you're above 50, you're doing better than average. If you're below 50, you're doing less well. The age wage scoring system is designed to help employers to understand whether their members have actually got value for money in aggregates. It's designed to help IGCs to compare their GPP with other people's GPPs. And it's designed to help uh, individuals to understand whether their pension pops are doing better or worse than average. As such, we believe that we've created something which looks very much like a common measure for value for money. And in analyzing individual pots, we're also able to see those pots which don't conform to our um, tolerance levels. And if they don't, we call them outliers. And if they're outliers, it may well be that there's a data problem with those pots. And we use the data problems as a proxy for the quality of the data, allowing trustees, IGCs, to be able to see the quality of the data that's been analyzed. So we've got two measures, a quality measure, and we've got a performance measure. We have a performance measure, which is per force net of costs, because an internal rate of return actually captures all the risks that the member is taking, including the costs within the scheme. So we're able to do benchmarking analysis, which compares one scheme with another, and we're able to allow individuals to compare one pot with another. And in this comparison process, we're allowing people the ability to actually engage with the performance that they've had and take decisions based not on advice, but based on data. 
Now, you might say that's okay. too Excuse blunt to me. measure, but it's the measure which we get to start with to help them to engage. Okay, so that's a little bit of a background about what we do at AgeWage. I'm now going to hand over to my good friend, Rustin Smith, who's going to talk a little bit about what it is that members actually want. And we're going to actually spend the next 45 minutes looking at value for money through the lens of the member, what they want, what they're interested in. So without more ado, I'd ask Rustin and Jeanette Weir, who's been working with Rustin on a project for the DWP, to uh, unmute themselves. And Jeanette, if you could share your screen, that would be great. Thank you very much indeed, Henry, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we've got 45 minutes. We're going to sort of capture and have a discussion around what matters most to pension savers. And within that, we're going to think about three key things. The annual statements that we all get and what the information is that people say they need. Um, how savers want to see the charges they pay and then bringing it back to value. How do they consider the value that they get for the charges they pay? We're going to base this session around the latest data that's come out um, from a costs and charges initiative, which was published this week. And that initiative essentially wanted to ask the question to consumers of the industry, do you want to see the charges that you pay on your statement? And if you do, what do you want to see? How do you want them presented? And how do you want it expressed? And as part of that, to provide you know, broader context to really understand those needs, we asked a broader set of questions around value. What do you expect to get for the money uh, that you've paid? So I'm gonna do a broad intro into this, and then I'm gonna hand over to Jeanette Weir, who's gonna sort of take you through the key findings of that research, and also share with you some of the video clips that we took as part of uh, that research. In terms of questions, please ask them as we go through. Ideally, we'd like to leave them to the end, but if you put up your virtual hand, we will come to you if we can, and we'll ask them as we go along. Now, just before we start, I just wanted to share with you the next slide um, on why this is important to me. Now, there are a number of uh, data points on here. Some are very, very recent, some are quite old, but this is a slide that I personally go back to from time to time to really remind myself of the challenges of everyday people our customers within the industry, which are therefore our challenges. And it kind of influences my thinking about what matters most to them and, and why things matter to them. So if you just look at the headings, this sort of paints a picture for me. Now, we might think that retirement savings at the center of everybody's universe, um, but people have really busy lives. Uh, they've got different sort of priorities. So they've got limited time. Uh, and we can all relate to that. If we get too much information, I mean, there's nothing more therapeutic than sort of deleting emails to, to get that number down. And, and so that means that when we start thinking about how we communicate to our members and the information that we provide and how we provide it, it's really important to think, how are they challenged and how can we meet their needs best? And then in terms of priorities, we've talked about limited time, too much information. But of course, you know, we might be quite privileged sitting here today. But the reality is that uh, many people have quite significant debt. If you're just coming out of university, you'll have uh, student debt. And then, of course, e even though if you're partway through your working career, savings that you have might be quite low. That's really quite relevant because we might be, make the assumption that the right thing to do is to actually increase your contributions so you can get more when you get to retirement. And the earlier you do that, the better. But some people just don't have the money to do that. And if they do, they might be better off actually paying off debt if they're paying quite high interest rates. So I think that what I wanted to capture here was, was just the broad headings, not the detail of the, of the data points, which would say some are quite dated, others are more up to date, but really just to get into the lives of everyday people and understand their challenges, which then through the next slide, I think, helps me to understand why what they want from us is so important and also needed. I mean, quite honestly, I do lots of research, uh, talking to people, but also with the support of people like Jeanette Weir uh, at Ignition House. 
But what I find consistently is that what people want is really quite clear and simple and quite limited. They want clear information. No surprise there then. They want it short. Why is that important? Because they haven't got very much time. And also, they don't want to have to try and interpret loads of information to try and make it simple for themselves. How many times have you bought something that's a flat pack and you think, oh, that looks straightforward, I'll have it knocked up in about sort of 20 minutes, only to see that there's a, a two inch instruction pack with it uh, and you try and follow it and it takes you so much longer. Short is really important. Keeping it simple simply means that it's quicker and easier to understand. And importantly, this comes through everything that I hear from everyday people, make it consistent. What I get from whether it's a contract-based scheme or whether it's trust-based and they don't know the difference between the two, if it's a statement, just make it the same like my bank statement, it's just easier. So the reality is that there's much more that we can do, but also we're making really good progress, I think, in the industry with the temporary annual statement that uh, is going to be a requirement from next year. Again, short, simple, and consistent, and also clear. And you'll see the sort of three bullet points at the bottom, because there are other areas that are being explored by the DWP. And I put standardized in front of everything, all of them, standardized, annual benefit statements, assumptions, and simple costs and charges, because standardized simply means consistent. So it's um, easier for the consumer. So really, it's, it's, done. it's how, can we, how can we address members' needs, our customers, to make things simple, and therefore to uh, improve engagement with them. Now, when we turn to the, the next slide, please, Jeanette, this really tells you a little bit about the initiative um, that we've just completed. It took just less than a, a year. And I'm just gonna go through very briefly the why, the how, and the what. So first of all, the why, we just think that this was a really important piece of work to really understand what mattered most to members. Putting in place a simpler annual statement is a big step forward because again, it's clear, short and simple. It will provide consistency through uh, trust-based statements. But what was missing was an explanation of the money that members actually pay, the costs and charges, and actually what they represent. So how do we do that? Well, like the simple annual statement, we essentially wanted to listen to our customers. It's, it's no good us assuming what we should give to customers. It's much more important to understand from them, is it important? What do you want to see and how do you want to see it? And again, just to make sure that the research that we did was going to be useful, we made sure that um, we worked with DWP, FCA and the pensions regulator in terms of the approach that we took and also the methodology to make sure that when it's completed, we could hand it to them and it's been handed to DWP so that they can then use it and take it from there. And as part of that, we also consulted with a wide industry stakeholder group, because again, it was important to take the industry with us. And in terms of the what, it was clearly to understand are charges important to see? How important are they? And how should they be shown and expressed? And then the broader research, what I think you'll find really interesting, was really about what matters most what do you expect to get for the charges you pay? And what are your expectations on us as an industry in terms of what we're delivering for you? So I'm now gonna hand over to Jeanette uh, and Jeanette's gonna take you at a high level through the output of that research. Thank you very much indeed, Jeanette. Okay, great, thanks Rustin. So I'm gonna take you through the, um, the findings of the research and the first headline finding that I'd like to leave you with is uh, this key fact. Shockingly, I think for me, and, and for many of you probably read the report as well, we see that despite best efforts of the industry and the millions of pounds that we spend on communication initiatives, at the moment, just 13% of members said that they read their statements and understood them well. And that's the green bar there. And you can see there's very little difference really there by the various age groups um, and also by gender. And we asked this question uh, two years ago when we did the simple annual statement research. And again, um, the dial hasn't really shifted 
is over that time period. And so to start off, we, we gave our members a little look at uh, the simpler and your studies. In our research, we wanted to sort of test um, what they felt about costs and charges, but without telling them the costs and charges uh, was the key part of, of what we were doing. So members were shown um, a version of the simpler annual statement, and they were asked to give their feedback on, on, on what they saw there, uh, on what they thought was important. And just as we saw uh, a couple of years ago, um, very much it's the circles on the statement, it's the key figures um, that people are interested in. You can see there from the quotes, my eyes were immediately drawn to the bubbles and the simple breakdown. And people very much appreciated the very simple and easy layout that they were seeing on the page. And you can see there the quote there as an example. The way that's laid out, that's cool, that's foolproof, everything's there. As a front page, that's exactly what I'd want to see. Uh, and the way that the, the format is laid out, um, people appreciated that, that they could see exactly what was going on there. And the final quote, quote says, it's really clear. You can see what you saved, what the employer has added, the total. It's just a breakdown of everything. And so um, just to reinforce that, um, our methodology was a mixture of talking to people through the depth research, and that's where those quotes are coming from in the videos that you'll see later. But we also ran a survey with a, with a thousand members. Uh, all members all currently contributing to their DC pension parts aged between 22 and 65. And uh, what we used in that survey uh, to mimic that initial impressions of the statements was something called a heat map. And you can see the results of that here. So the way the heat map works is that people are asked in the survey to click on something uh, on the statement that, that was of interest to them. Um, and then once they'd clicked, uh, a second button came up to color code it. Uh, the greens are where they had a positive reaction to what they were seeing. Uh, the yellowy color is a neutral reaction and the red is a negative reaction. And you can very much see by the clustering that we've, we've got here, their eyes are drawn to the circles. That's the key piece of information that we want to see. Um, looking down at the costs and charges, you can see a scattering of, of, um, of little circles there. Um, in total, there, was, there were a few, um, and I have to say the vast majority of those uh, were very positive. They were coming through on the green side rather than the red or the yellow. So well, I would say members did pay attention to costs and charges to some degree, they were more naturally interested in the value of the savings than that particular piece of information. We then took our members on a journey to look at costs and charges explicitly. Uh, we told them this is what the research was about, um, and we asked them whether they thought uh, what, what their reactions were to sort of seeing costs and charges for the first time. And for many, they hadn't actually realised that this was um, part of parcel of the pension. Um, and yet, when we look at the quantitative data, which gives the robust numbers on this, the vast majority weren't aware that they were paying charges, but yet they weren't particularly surprised either. And when we were speaking to people, they were like, yeah, I just feel a bit stupid. You know, you don't get something for nothing in any aspect. There's charges everywhere. Why should a pension be any different? The conversation turned to thinking about how they wanted to see those charges displayed on their statement. And we tested several things with members. It was very clear that once they became aware that there was a charge, the charge does matter to them and they want to see what they pay. We tested whether they would like to see a breakdown of costs and charges, uh, splitting out administration from investment fees or whether a single charge would be acceptable. On balance, we found that members preferred the breakdown and they didn't want too much information. And so a simple split into admin and investment fees was acceptable. There's no need to go much further than that in terms of splitting out the investment fees any further. Um, partly the breakdown um, helps them understand what they're paying for um, and where the value for money is going. Partly it also 
um, from a behavioural economics perspective, if you see several things in smaller chunks, it just feels a little bit less. Um, to see we asked members whether they would want to see their costs displayed in pounds and pence rather than or percentages. And very much, it was over 70% in the survey came back and said that pounds and pence was their preference. And this is very much uh, the um, information that we got back in our qualitative research as well. It's the way that people think. Um, they see costs and charges in a day-to-day -day basis and other things in pounds and pence. And actually lots of people admitted that they pretty much struggled with percentages. So it's much easier for them to see it that way. To make things a little bit uh, easier for people, we talked about costs being represented out of every hundred pounds or every thousand pounds. So 55p out of every hundred, five pounds 50 out of every thousand. And then we asked them what their preference was, which of those did they like the best? And again, it's the very clear steer with it with 55p out of every hundred pounds um, was the one that they liked. Uh, the reason for that was, again, it felt it felt smaller, it felt easier, um, it felt more in line with the sorts of pensions that they had in terms of uh, being on early stages of their journey. Some people may not have thousands and thousands of pounds in their pensions, but also for those who were thinking that they might want to compare and contrast and sort of turn this into a percentage in their head, that calculation was much easier to do with the hundred rather than the thousand. So how do we explain this? What terminology do we use um, for our members? Uh, and as part of the steering group, it was suggested that we would test four things, uh, price, cost, charges, and fees. Of the four, price wasn't acceptable. Um, this isn't a price, it isn't fixed, it doesn't feel like a price. It's not like, uh, you know, you're all paying the same. There was a recognition there that this would vary depending on how much you had in your pot given that it was 55p out of every hundred pounds. Uh, but when it came to the other three costs, charges or fees, there wasn't really a major uh, winner there. Fees, the feedback there was that felt a little bit expensive um, uh, and costs and charges, there wasn't much difference between the two, but on balance, if you had to go for one, probably charges just about takes it there. The preference for the passive has been taken, charges has been taken from your fund rather than the active we've taken. Uh, came as a surprise to me as a sort of communications tester. I always like to see more active rather than uh, passive text, but very much uh, the members said, well, there has been taken, it just feels a little bit softer. Um, the, I have one, one respondent who says, uh, the we've taken just feels like I've been mugged. Um, and members were very strong on this last point. If no charges can be shown, this should be very explicit on the statements. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And I'll hopefully show you some videos of them giving their views directly. And so once members have come to the recognition that there is a charge uh, and they pay it, they are very interested in seeing it on their statements. I mean, I think the numbers here speak for themselves. Um, and as Rustin alluded to earlier, you know, they're all about consistency. Members get very confused by pensions and seeing different things in different ways. And even slight nuances of terminology can really throw them off guard. And so what they're really after here, as you see, pension providers, and as Rustin says, it doesn't matter if it's a trust or a contract based scheme, they don't if they obviously know in. They just know they're in the pension scheme and they want all of their providers to present the cost that they're paying in a consistent and simple way. And here's just a few quotes from the kinds of conversations that I was having. I think transparency is important. I think whoever's got a pension, we want to know exactly what we're paying, especially as my money at the moment is not easily come by, is it? We want every penny to count. And members saying nobody's expecting to get something for nothing. You don't expect to work and not get paid. Somebody's decided to take the money, spend the time investing people's pension money. Of course, that's going to cost. But just tell us what it's going to cost. And then it's freedom of choice. If I want to pay 1.5% or I want to pay half percent, that's up to me. And the final quote there, I think, really resonated with me. 
Today I was shocked because I didn't know we paid charges for pension. And as much as clearly I've not done enough research as I should have done on the pension, I don't feel I'm alone. So at which point you're a bit, hang on a minute, it's sort of been backdoored in there. It was probably somewhere in between all the jargon, but I think it needs to be more transparent. At the end of the day, people should know what they're paying. And if there are any alternatives to that, because you get loads of people asking you to switch your pension to them. So there's just some sentiments there of how members are feeling about that transparency and consistency. As we touched on earlier, members do take a pretty dim view of providers who can't show individual charges. They were told as part of the research that they Janet, I think we may have lost you with regard to your voice. Could you possibly take your video off? Henry, probably a good time to pick up questions at the moment to see if yeah, we can well, while, we, while we're waiting for Janet to get, come back online, um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one from Martin Tingle. Uh, do different approaches, language, media work, um, differently with different cohorts, uh, e.g. papal, pit, pictograms uh, for men who are um, less than 35, online personalised animation for women who are greater than 50. Um, would you like to comment on that, uh, Rustin, while we're waiting? Yeah, I'm afraid that's not my area of expertise, I'm afraid, Henry. Um, <clears throat> I imagine that, yeah, there could be some differences there, but... Um, that's why I always delegate the complicated side of um, research to Jeanette. Um, so unfortunately, I, I couldn't answer that honestly. Hi. I'm sorry. Are Hi, Jeanette. We, we have you back. Great. Do you want to take that question now, or do you want to uh, uh, to carry on with your presentation? Well, Henry, I was just about to show you uh, some montages of the members uh, talking. So that would seem to be a good point. So I'm just going to load up my video now and hopefully it will play. So hopefully you can now see the start of the video. You can just give me a thumbs up, uh, Henry, that you can hear this in just a second. Your work. It's not very clear, Janet. Janet, we can we can hear it, but we can't see it. So, is it a video you can play? It is. Let me just stop again. Okay. So, what I'm going to play now. I mean, we were talking about uh, value for money before um, and thinking about what that might mean for members as part of our journey. So the first video clip that I'm going to show you is members giving their perspective on what value for money is all about. Have you got that on the screen? I'm sorry, we're not seeing it yet, Jeanette. Yeah, okay, that's better. Yep. yep. All right, let's give it a go. You're worth paying the extra because you're you think like if you're getting a cheap option, like it's it's never as good, and you'll end up replacing it eventually because you find better or you know things like that. I always think that you're better spending the money and get it done right. Okay, so when we're thinking about a pension. What, what sort of things would you be thinking about in terms of in trying to assess whether you get value for money there? Um, I'd probably compare the admin pay against the money they're making span settlement investment. I would like it, you know, if it's an expensive admin fee or a managing fee, well, if it's gonna get me a good return in the invest them selling my investment or buying it, that's where I pay that 
you know, if one company was twenty pound more, but they're giving me a better turnover, I would look at that. I think. Like sometimes you do want the best bargain and to pay less money, but when it's something so important, you do want to pay a little bit more. You don't want to be on the lowest um, like plan or whatever um, it's called, um, just because it's essentially your future, isn't it? So you want to be getting the best value, but you also want to make sure that it is the right one as well because you don't want to be paying for something that's not going to help you later down the line. So, Natasha, if you're thinking about value for money for a pension, mm -hmm. what, what things would sort of come into that equation? What kinds of things would you be thinking about when you're weighing up? Is one kind of better than another? Well, you'd want support. I think it's good that if you want to talk about the investment side of it, there should be people on hand. So if you are paying a little bit more, there should be more help and support. Whereas if you're on the basic or paying less, um, fees I feel like the support you would get is less yeah and an actual human rather than just frequently asked questions and then it's got a drop down and you try and find your question um well in a pension I, I guess because mine's a work place I didn't really choose it I'm honest they kind of chose it for me but um my I'm probably the worst person when it comes to buying anything I've got the least amount of patience for shopping around and um if I see something and I like it I don't want it I'm probably a brand person so I tend to go with the brands especially with car insurance I'll maybe go on a search and I'll go with the brand that I recognize you know so um I yeah probably not the best idea or best example but that's pretty much my theory on it I uh I don't really spend a lot of time researching. I think value for money for me would be in, you know, investments that, you know, I suppose that would be going in the right direction, you know, if they're uh, providing they are, I'm quite happy to, you know, pay for someone that's going to be looking at it carefully and, and making the right, you know, making, you know, more educated investments rather than, you know, seeing a loss and paying for that. So, yeah, if, if things are going the right way, you know, I'd be happy to pay more for it. So would you would you have any sense of um, whether all pension companies charge roughly the sort of same, or do you think there's quite a big variation going on in the market? I wouldn't have a clue, to be honest. I would have presumed that it is a fairly volume-based thing. I would have assumed like most of them are similarly priced, but they just want to get as many customers as possible so that there would be quite close. I think I'd probably be more surprised if there's ones with a load of different um, cost options than if they were all bunched together. Yeah, so it's quite sort of competitive and they're all after the sort of same business. Yeah. I would, thought, I would have thought so, because at the end of the day, I, I see it as like they're using everyone's money to make more money by investing it cleverly so that everyone's propped up when they're more secured, but then we're essentially giving them the fuel they need to make their money in the meantime that's my understanding of it anyway so for you with 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 sort of life and, and pensions think would would cheapest always be best or you know if you're if there was a cheaper scheme on offer would you look at it um i think <clears throat> i think mine would be like to make me want to move i would be less worried about the costs and I'd be more worried about what I'm getting back because it's like this mm. massive that is like your retirement money for the rest of your life and it's actually really super important so I would actually not care as much about the cost but more about like that yeah like how's it shown to me and, and clarity on what's going on to be honest yeah within, within reason you know like if it's going to be something that's you know significant you know i don't know how much percentage higher than everyone else then it would be something to think about but providing it was you know going in the right direction and yeah the the, the, the pot's getting bigger then yeah i'd be happy to go with someone that's you know not the cheapest okay so that was um the value for money clip there let me just stop sharing that so what you can definitely see there um is members giving their impressions um, of, of what value for money is and whether cheapest is best. And very clearly in our research, it came out that actually 
you know, they wouldn't want the cheapest bid on offer necessarily. Value for money for them is much more than that. Um, and you can hear as they're having those conversations, starting to work themselves around of their own accord without me having to prompt them towards sort the concept of kind of net benefit, which is basically looking at the investment returns over time, taking off the charges and then and seeing, seeing what value, what money is being added to the pond overall. And we were really heartened in the research because we were looking to test that concept of something that's been used in Australia. We had all the stimulus ready. I was ready to take them through all of those discussions um, and explain it to them. And half of the time actually that was their own view. I didn't have to go through all that rigmarole. It was just um, uh, they in their minds already that that's what sort of value for money was. And just sitting around that, uh, you can sort of starting to hear them talking about um, things like brand being well established, having a longevity in the market, um, having a choice of performance and, and choice of funds. Um, but also the sort of softer side of things, so the support that they were going to get. And all of those things sort of fed in, into the mix there when they were starting to think about value for money. Um, one of the things that came out quite clearly from our research was that um, lots of our members are obviously in, in workplace pensions. Um, and there's just an overarching sense that somehow they don't have to perhaps worry too much uh, about the costs and charges that they're paying because their employer is taking a very active interest in that. You can see the statistics here, you know, significant proportion saying my employer set up my pension and I expect that they will be monitoring the situation to ensure that the charge I am paying is competitive. And while I think that's very true at the larger end of the scheme, lots and lots and lots of members I mean, very small employers, but this has simply been a tick box compliance exercise. And I know from the conversations that I have with those sorts of employers, they most definitely are not monitoring the costs and charges to make sure that the member is still getting value for money there. There is a sense from members, as you heard in some of those clips, that all pension companies are roughly charging the same. A significant proportion of people thought that, and even more sort of felt it was true. Um, and here's the data that says the cheapest is always best. And you can see a relatively small proportion of people thinking that. So before I hand back to Lofton, uh, if the technology permits, I'm just going to do one more video for you. So just bear with me just a second. And this clip is basically, as I've been alluding to, members um, were taken on the journey of being shown costs and charges and then were asked for their thoughts about uh, what they would think of providers who actually couldn't show costs and charges in a consistent way on the statement, whether they could show it at all, and whether some sort of average cost would be acceptable. And so, hopefully you can see that clip. Henry, can you just put your fingers up so you can see? And I'm just going to play. I just feel like I'd just be a bit confused if one was doing it differently to the other. Um, because if obviously one's showing it, you'd then question the other. But if both of them were doing it the same, you'd, you wouldn't need to question anything because it'd have the same format. Just why not? What have they got to hide? There's something not right here. Yeah, it would maybe be quite uncomfortable, I think. If they if they had that line on their shirt that said, uh, I'm sorry, you know, we're supposed to have an individual charge for you, but but we can't do it, how would that make you feel about the company? Why why can't they do it? You know, like what why can other companies do it and they can't, you know, there's, there's something they're not doing, there's a reason they're not doing it, I don't know what it is, but it just trusts where they like level of trust drops massively with that. Yeah. What about you, Christy, and how would you feel about that? I would be confused as well. I'd be thinking why they haven't um, included it. And I'd also be doubting the company um, in terms of how um, how much effort they're putting into the account, um, into researching things and conveying a clear message. Yeah, same thing. I would just think that maybe it was a scam or just something not right that they weren't sharing with you. 
then that would come up with like an average or an indicative charge. Would that be good enough for you or would you still want to see your charge? I think I would like to see my charge. I'm not really concerned about anybody else. Um, yeah, definitely just my own. I don't think, I, I think it would be, that's quite a personal thing. So I don't know if I would want to know, maybe if everybody was getting the same, getting charged the same, it wouldn't matter. But yeah, I think I would rather keep it yeah. just for, for me. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to stop the clip there. And now I'm going to hand back to Rustin. He's just going to summarise for you what we've been hearing there. But hopefully that's a flavour of some of the very powerful statements that people were making about uh, consistency of costs and charges. Rustin, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Jeanette. <clears throat> and I hope everybody found that useful, particularly those video clips which really sort of bring it to life. Um, and you can see how people think about different things in a slightly different way, but almost reach the same conclusion. I mean, the sort of key takeaway from me is that clearly people are more interested in the value of their pension savings than the charges they pay, but they're critically um, interested in how much they're going to get at retirement. As they say, retirement's a very long time. They're contributing what they can afford. Um, they're not interested in the lowest cost. They just want to make sure that the, the way in which we use or spend or even invest the charges that they make, we as trustees or IGCs, we deliver the very best financial outcomes for them. And that's what they're critically interested in. But in terms of the charges themselves, um, some weren't aware that charges were made, but clearly they weren't surprised. They expect to be charged for stuff where they get a service. Um, but when it comes to those charges on their statements, they want, again, going back to those earlier key messages, they just want it simple. They want it consistent right across the piece, whether that's a contract-based scheme or a trust-based scheme. And they don't really understand the difference between the two. They get a statement and they just want it to be presented in the same way. They want it in pounds and pence um, and they want to be able to understand it with a breakdown between the admin and the investment, but not really going further than that. And also the, the final key message, and we saw that in the last video, was that you know if we come across and say, well, it's really quite difficult, we can actually deduct this money from your savings, but we can't actually calculate how much it is for you individually, and we can't put it on your statement, that's going to affect trust. So you know, there's a clear message for the industry that you know transparency builds trust, which we know but costs and charges are an area where their expectation is really quite simple. You charge me, you deduct it, please show me what it is. And then building on that, help me understand what I'm getting for that money. So I think this is a great opportunity to build on the Simple Annual Statement. Uh, we've got a, a great chance now, having listened to what our customers have told us to put these costs and charges on the statement in a way that they've asked us to. Um, and then also to help them understand, you know, what they're paying for. What does value mean? How is their pot being built up? And how are we trying to deliver the very best outcomes for members? So I hope that was really helpful. Um, I anticipate we may have a few questions. In terms of what's next from this, well, we've handed that research to the DWP. As I say, throughout the whole process, we work very closely with uh, the pensions regulator, TPR, uh, the SCA and also DWP to make sure that what we were doing was appropriate and we got the methodology right uh, and obviously to hold our feet to the fire in the output of that research. We also included a wider industry group um, and also we worked with others, uh, industry associations and, and the likes of MAPS as well. So that's with the DWP. I don't know where that's going to go or how it's going to end up. Maybe that's a question for our colleagues in the next session. Um, but I do know that they're considering it and they're also considering it alongside the work they've been doing on permitted charges and also standardised assumptions. So, Henry, that's all from me. I hope that was helpful. I hope it was um, interesting and um, questions, I guess. Well, thank you very much indeed. And yes, it was helpful and yes, it was interesting. And if no one else has got any questions, I certainly have. But I think uh, we're beginning to see some questions coming in on the chat. Uh, and I'll start with Mark, Mark Ormston, uh, who's asking, were participants asked what they expect to see or would like to see within the annual statement if they were starting from scratch? Uh, and alternative, what do they think the purpose of the annual statement is? So two different questions, but I think linked. 
So shall I take that one, Henry? Yeah. Um, probably, probably the background to the SIMP annual statement came out of the automatic enrollment review in 2017 and a sort of leading on engagement in, in that review. And we looked at the statements because we couldn't quite understand why people weren't engaged with them and they weren't reading them. So what we did is we, we did ask uh, customers what they wanted to see to, to test that what was on the statement was the right thing. And we worked closely with Quiet Room who developed that having listened to customers. We used again, Ignition House to do that independent research to make sure we got it right. But importantly, um, one of the things I was testing is is regulation getting in the way? Because actually, I'll be honest, that was my first assumption. This regulation is driving us to 30 pages of annual statements. The honest, honest answer was it really wasn't because when we got lawyers to help us and we spoke to the DWP and we really understood the regulation, we realized we could get it on just over one and a half pages, obviously with links and doing the right thing, but, but that made it, it compliant. So we, we did ask those customers what they wanted and, and it now reflects that. And you'll see that in the sort of key sections of the report, which um, have now been laid before parliament. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. And Stephen, I can see Stephen Glover's got his hand up. Stephen, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Some reason we can't hear you, Stephen. I'm going to come back to you, Stephen, in a second. I wanted to ask a question um, of, uh, of you both. And that is um, that the, the minister has said that whatever goes on to these statements Second. ought to really be on the pension dashboards. Um, do you think that the pension dashboard and the statements are, are pretty well the same thing? Are, are they just going to be running in parallel? Um, and and do you, how, how, do you see, how do you see your kind of analog type um, statements, paper statements being uh, developed into a sort of digital world. Shall I take it first, Jeanette, yeah. and then hand over to you uh, for you to give the real answer, probably. Um, from my point of view, Henry, just going back to listening to what matters most to our customers, they want it short, clear, simple and consistent. So my expectation is the numbers that we've got on the annual statements that they receive every year should be replicated on the dashboard uh, in, using the same language, using the same numbers, and importantly, using the same assumptions. It would not make sense if you got two or three annual statements through your door, you looked at the numbers, you then went onto the dashboard, you saw different language and different numbers. That would be completely confusing uh, and would not help in, with trust in the industry. So that would be my point of view. Jeanette, what's yours? Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, that consistency is key. People are very confused by pensions for all sorts of reasons. So they start off with a very low baseline of knowledge and understanding and confidence in their own ability to understand what's going on. Um, and so therefore, we have to make everything consistent because if we don't, they'll just got even more confused and that will lead to disengagement and that would be a bad outcome for everybody. Um, and I think I would also say, you know, the digital versus analog world. Certainly from, from the members that we've had in our research and both programmes, we've certainly found that there were an awful lot of members, as you could see from one of the charts I showed you earlier on, who couldn't recall getting an annual statement. Um, and that was quite worrying, given that it is actually a legal requirement. And when we sort of dug into it a bit further, what we find is they're often with the providers who are digital only. And therefore, there, there seems to be some work to be done to make sure that members are even getting this basic information. And for me, there's a difference there between uh, something that is sent to you, that you get, that you can look at um, on a regular basis versus dashboard, which I think is going to be more proactive and it's going to be up to you to log in. I'm not entirely sure we can hire members to do that. OK, we've got the thick and fast questions. I will come back to you, Stephen, in a second. I just wanted to clear with John. John Parker, you were asking whether uh, there were common assumptions which, which were coming out of this. Did Ruston's statements uh, make you feel comfortable about that? They did, absolutely. Yes, thanks for the clarification on that. OK, that's great. Um, I will come to you now, Stephen, if you can take yourself off mute and hopefully we'll hear you. I think, uh, can you hear me now? 
Yes, we can. Very, very good. So, um, so this is a question for Rustin, but also for you, Henry, because you're involved in very, you know, similar you know, parallel initiatives, shall I say? Uh, so the the paradox that kind of always I always wrestle with with in the VFM for pensions is that the value that really matters in a pension scheme is the value of the pot available to the member at the point of retirement. Um, so therefore, this value cannot be truly assessed until that until that point is reached so my so my question is are your excellent initiatives likely to over encourage shorter term investing of members assets yeah are we giving uh, too much information too soon and we'd be better off not giving people information might be the implication of what you were saying I'm, I'm, I, I, i'll just come in very quickly I, i'm I, i'm as guilty as anybody i have a, I, I have a dc pension pot and and uh, i'm as guilty as I, I i i can look at its value every single day and i'm as guilty as, as anybody i can't resist looking at it most days um even though i know when it drops 10 percent, it might you know recover that some sometime later being in a being from an investment background which of course not everybody is rustin do you want to comment on the uh, uh on whether we're making too much available too soon yeah I, I don't think we are because i think people are interested in the retirement savings that they have built up i, I think there's a challenge for trustees and igcs to start thinking about how, how do you think how you're investing with members' charges. So, you know, to what extent, not just looking at the, the current value of savings, but also then thinking about the future net risk adjusted returns, and then looking at perhaps what is the median outcome for different members at different stages or different phases, looking at the upside. So what could they get if things went really well and also then the downside. And that could even be sort of put in a table and explained very simply for members. Not everybody will be interested in that level of detail, but how can we help people understand, you know, what they're investing in, but also how we are thinking about maybe charging a little bit more, but making sure we're delivering disproportionately higher levels of retirement outcome. Because, you know, we've listened to everybody today and that's what they want. Lowest cost is not the best. It's I'll pay you, but I'm looking for a good financial retirement outcome because my retirement could be a very long time. Jeanette, there's one question here which I would really like you to answer, and that's from Jatin. Um, were there any insights into what can make value for money statements credible and trustworthy for members, aside from the concise information? Well, I think it, it's truth and honesty and not, not over-egging the pudding, isn't it? I mean, you know, we, we have to... to, to you know, be consistent, and, and we also have to tell members things in a, in the same way. So one of the things that um, when we talked about the net benefit concept over in Australia that they liked was the fact that this was an independent look um, at how schemes were performing. So there was no kind of fudging going on, and you know, schemes doing their own calculations because they were very, very wary of that. Um, and it doesn't have to be an independent body, of course. It, it, you know, it could be a commercial firm, de facto ratings, those sorts of things. They all know and trust those sorts of things. So they're looking for some sort of independent review um, when, when they're looking at that sort of net benefit concept. Um, and I think uh, value for money, I think, you know, they, it, it's about explaining what, what they're going to get. So as part of the research, we, we sort of asked them, well, what do you think your charges are paying for? And they, they said, well, you know, it's probably to, to, to do with administration and then there's the investment charges. And then we showed them some stimulus that the industry working group had, had helped us put together. Uh, Pete Blancy had, had delivered uh, some stuff from Scottish Widows and we built on the PLSA's value for members. Um, and we showed them, you know, four buckets of, of things that they get for the money investment returns, the communications, uh, the administration. And then we, there was another bucket called governance. And they really never heard of this at all. And that was a complete surprise to them. So I think we can do a lot more to help them understand in very simple terms just what it is that they're paying for. Thank you very much indeed. We, we've got uh, some interesting points and I, I'd refer you to the chat. Uh, Whereas Leslie uh, Carline is making the point that we're not using the same language consistently, I'm sure uh, that Quiet Room would uh, concur with that. I see Mark scratching his head there, Mark Scantlebury. Um, yes, it, it's fascinating, isn't it? 
this question of honesty, how much we show people, how clear we are about things, whether or not people should be trusted with their own information. There's a whole load of questions brewing here, which I hope will be picked up in the next session, where we're going to have um, three uh, notable uh, regulators. Uh, we're going to have Andrew Blair from the DWP, who's uh, been very much involved in the uh, work which the government's engaged on in consolidation of schemes using value for money as a means to help people see whether or not their scheme is providing value for members. Uh, Cosmo Gibson, who's been working with the IGCs and GAAs, uh, helping them to understand the value that their provider is offering relative to other providers by using a, a kind of common metric. And Louise Sivia, who is uh, working with the pension regulator and whose job it will be to make sure that much of this comparative work is uh, actually happening. And we're going to be looking over the next hour at what the regulatory environment looks like and how it touches on these two key questions. How do we measure value for money and what good can value for money do in improving member outcomes? So I'd like uh, Louise, Andrew and uh, Cosmo uh, to take themselves off mute and come to the fore if they may. I hope you're all there. There's so many people on this call, it's hard to see. Um, Hi there, Henry. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> excellent. And um, Cosmo and Andrew, can you make yourself aware, me, uh, me aware of your being there? Hello. The yeah, Andrew, I'm here. That's super. And Cosmo, have we got you? Cosmo is just joining now. Excellent. Right, right. Well, I'm going to kick off with Andrew. Um, Andrew, would you like to just give us in a, in, a, in a couple of minutes what your particular work has uh, ha has been about in, in relation to value for money and how value for money really impacts on, on, on your thinking? Sure, happy to start. Thanks very much for having me, Henry, and hello, everyone. Good to see you on uh, Friday afternoon. Um, so from our perspective, DWP, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the senior policy advisor who heads up our work on investment and governance um, in the DC space. Value for money for us for a long time has been linked to our agenda to consolidate the DC market. So that's certainly one of the one of the drivers, and we'll speak a lot, I hope, about that today. Um, in the name of uh, uh, economies of scale and, and building scale within the DC market to the benefit of members. So that that with our regulations that came into force or will come into force um, on the next scheme year in 2022. Uh, are about driving consolidation and, and the, the betterment for members there. So we have that VFM framework for sub 100 million pound schemes in place. Um, we're now sort of moving beyond that, thinking about those schemes not in scope, what value for money uh, or value for members, as we, we call it uh, sometimes. Um, today will be value for money. Um, will uh, look like for, for larger schemes and, and how do we weight the various factors and consider how larger schemes might need a different framework to, to those smaller schemes, or even if they do. So that's really where we're, we're at at the moment. Hopefully that sets the context and, and our interest from DWP. Um, Louise, uh, you're working closely with the DWP, obviously TPR does, but um, how, how do you see your role as uh, distinct? Um, and, and, and what areas are you interested in with regard to value for money? Sure. So, um, so yeah, like the like the DWP, you know, um, TPR, we've uh, we've been interested in uh, value for money in DC schemes for a long time, and we've been kind of evolving the proposition around that. Um, but essentially, that you know, the, the reason for it is that as we as we know, DC savers they're not guaranteed um, a level of retirement income in the same way that DB savers are, and the only way that they can maximise the contributions that they pay into their um, into their retirement savings is if, the, if that scheme is providing a value for money for them. And at the moment, it's very hard for trustees and IGCs, um, regulators um, and savers to actually assess the value that's being delivered um, in the context of the, of the broad DC market. So particularly as we kind of move to a more consolidated market where actually the schemes that remain in the market won't be expected um, to exit necessarily um, it's about finding a way to really um, consistently assess and compare the value for money that's being offered um, 
so in, in DB schemes, there is a benchmark, there's the funding target. Um, so, and as a regulator, you know, we receive data that enables us to identify where the risks are in that system and to, um, and to intervene and address those risks. And it would be really great to get to a place where we have um, a consistent measurement of value for money in DC schemes and a similar ability to use consistent data to um, identify and address the risks in the same way. Um, and of course, for trustees um, and IGCs, employers and ultimately savers, of course, um, we want them to be able to very clearly identify how their scheme is performing um, relative to others um, and where it isn't to be able to take very clear steps to either rectify to rectify that, whether that's um, through making improvements to the scheme or through moving to another option for their savers. So, so that's that's our really clear focus is actually making sure that what the savers are getting um, is value delivered to them. And Cosmo, thanks very much, Lou. Cosmo, are you with us now? I am. You yes. are. Hello. Hello, Cosmo. And uh, of course, you have a, a, a different uh, constituency to talk with. You're talking to the IGCs and the GAAs. How do you see uh, value for money? And is it different from what you've just heard from Andrew and, and Louise? No, I don't, I don't think it's different. Um, I suppose, you know, I'd, I'd kind of echo everything that, that they said and also add that, you know, this is a a kind of journey that started back with the OT review of workplace pensions in 2013. Um, uh, IGCs are introduced in, in our world, in, in the contract based world. Um, um, and, you know, we've done various things since to kind of try and bolster the I, IGC role um, and give them more things to look at, obviously, outside of, of workplace. And that's the thing I'd add here, really, which is that obviously the intersection with our world and, and DWPs and TPRs is, is in the workplace, but we're also, you know, regulating non-workplace pensions. We don't want to leave them out from this debate and, and the framework that, you know, we put out in our DP with TPR um, is in theory, you know, would, would be something that ultimately we want to apply across all of DC pensions, not just in the workplace world where, you know, probably more focused on value for money up to now. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be maintaining that focus. Um, and I think to also say it's important that um, we don't just focus on the, the active um, new schemes, but we also look at, continue looking at legacy and we'd encourage IGCs, I think we send our publications to continue looking at legacy schemes as well, because um, we think there are still issues in legacy, both in workplace and non-workplace. Um, but it's about applying that framework consistently across pensions so that ultimately stakeholders, um, uh, you know, investment consultants, EPs, uh, members themselves get comparable and um, consistent information on performance, um, which they can then use to make decisions. Um, that's what I would add. Okay, thanks very much, Cosmo. I, I think the FCA have in the past been uh, very much thought of as the enforcers, if you like, of uh, a low cost environment uh, and very much focused on uh, value for money as a, a, as a cost measurement. Um, have you moved on from that? And do you think that the perception was wrong in the first place? Um, well, I mean, I, I suppose, you know, I don't think it was wrong in the first place in the sense that a lot of the early work was about trying to bring costs down, right? So a lot of the early work that IGCs did was making sure that all the workplace schemes are under the charge cap, you know, all of the fault schemes are under the charge cap, and then looking at legacy schemes and making sure that they, um, you know, got below 1% in terms of charges. So um, that was a very charge-focused world. I don't think we, we could deny that. But I think, well, I hope we've been clear in our, in our recent papers that, we do see value for money holistically. So we're talking about not just costs and charges, which is still an important element, but very definitely also about investment performance and service. And that all of those elements are important and equally important um, for the members. And so um, I wouldn't describe it as moving away from costs and charges either, because I think, you know, there's, it's still important to focus on what consumers are paying for what they get. Um, and I'd say that's especially true 
you know, like in the non-workplace area where there hasn't really been a focus, you know, on costs and charges up to now, um, um, in the same way that hasn't that there has been in workplace, for example. But you know, we are trying to see this holistically, and we are trying to say, you know, this is about the whole package. So value for money means what you're getting for what you pay, not just what you pay. So in, in, in your world, you'd be able to compare as an individual the value for money from your non-workplace pension, your workplace pension with a common measure. Is that, is that where you're getting at? I think ultimately, I mean, obviously we're some way from that. And, you know, that's not going to be something we can instantly deliver. But, you know, this all goes as well with, you know, where we're going with dashboards, hopefully, which is that, you know, you see all your pensions in one place and, you know, we don't want to be in a world, I think, where every, where people are just seeing the costs and charges and deciding that they want to move all their money into the one with the lowest charge. So you would want to be able to compare, you know, relevant metrics of value for money across all of those things. And then if you were in the game of, you know, wanting to put all your pensions in one place, you'd be able to make a kind of holistic comparison between those things um, with or without assistance, guidance, advice from, you know, a third party. Um, which would then, you know, put you a better place than just focusing on which is the lowest charging product of the ones I've got. And um, I should put all my money in that one, um, which I think has its dangers, right? Yeah, I mean, so you see value for money as, as a sort of framework for people to take decisions on things such as consolidation and so on. Yeah. yeah I think ultimately that's where we want to get to. Um, I think we would admit, and I think we said in our paper that, you know, in bits of the market, yeah, members aren't particularly. I um, mean, I think that's that's true in most of the pensions marketplace. Um, and so there's clearly a role for others as well. So, you know, employers, like I said, investment consultants, EVCs, people who kind of intermediate on behalf of members or or people buying you know, on behalf of members, so trustees um, or employers. So it might not be that the individual member is making those decisions, but somebody's making those decisions on their behalf who is, you know, better informed as a result of this work. Thanks, Cosmo. Uh, Lou, uh, Cosmo mentioned their quality of service a couple of times, and I know your um, discussion paper talks about kite marks, the quality assessments. Can you standardise a quality of service? Um, I think it's a very, it, it's a tricky one. Uh, but I think it can be done. And I think, you know, we're, we're not starting from a blank sheet of paper um, on this issue. Um, there has been um, obviously work done um, in various pockets of the industry already to try and um, to try and standardize this kind of, you know, what 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 does good look like um, in this in this space and how how might you badge it as such? So, for example, you know, PASTA have done a lot of good work on the scheme administration side in terms of developing an accreditation framework. And, you know, so so there are there are things that we can we can build on and perhaps even incorporate um, into this. I think the key is in distilling the elements that um, do actually add value to the saver um, for these purposes. So um, we've we've identified, you know, the 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 key areas of kind of scheme oversight, administration, um, and member communications. But there's more drilling down to be done into into each of those areas to identify. Okay, so what is it that actually adds value, and what kinds of things are sort of bells and whistles which might be attractive to savers, and it might make that you know it might give them. Um, a better customer experience, if you like, but actually looking at does it in the long term deliver um, deliver better value. So that that's where the challenge will be, I think. But I do think I do think that we can um, develop some standardisation around this um, for which which would be the basis on which the value is measured. Um, and then obviously, you know, um, schemes will be still free to decide whether they want to add on additional things as well. Um, but whether that forms part of the key value offering is what we would need to focus on. Certainly, if you look in the IGC reports, they uh, make a lot of references to net promoter scores. And, and uh, there's quite a lot of work being done on uh, how people feel about the quality of service they've got. Do you feel that those kind of things can be incorporated inside of a, a quality assessment? Um, I, I think I think certainly um, you know feedback from from the savers is something that can be can be incorporated. Um, 
But again, it's about asking the right questions and it's making sure actually are we identifying the things that ultimately will impact on on the savers um, on the savers outcomes. Um, obviously, one thing to consider as well is, you know, maintaining confidence in the pension system as being something, you know, if, you, if, if people don't have confidence in the system, um, then obviously that's not that's not going to help. Um, help ensure that they stay on track to get um, to get a good retirement outcome. So there, there are there it's distinguishing the things that are the kind of key pillars. So things like data quality, for example, um, and um, accurate and timely communications and things that, that the things that really, if they got wrong, can really impact the ultimate value, I think. OK, so there are must do's and the nice to have. And you're going to start with the must do's and, and, and move on to the nice to have. So I know that a lot of people feel uh, but the nice to have so actually the things that drive um, better behaviours. Um, uh, but I, I hear conflicting things about these kind of softer factors. Um, Andrew, I, I mean, you're, um, you've made some quite strong statements in, in your publication saying that you don't think that the soft factors are so important in VFM assessments. Um, am I misreading them or, or is that the case? And, and could you give us some feedback about the the guidelines which you've been uh, issuing in terms of the uh, um, value of uh, these value assessments. Yeah, definitely. I think it's not a mischaracterization to say that we thought the soft factors uh, were less important than some of the core elements, uh, which we I think we were aligned with TPR and FCA on that. The, the must must haves and the nice to haves. Um, certainly, from our value for members assessment, the, the must haves were a level of performance, uh, investment performance, a level of net returns that was. Uh, you know, co at least comparable, if not better, than three uh, larger schemes, one of which you have as a small scheme engaged with on, on moving members into. So that was our sort of core of our framework. And then the soft factors, I guess, which is probably not a too helpful a phrase, um, w were there. So I, I wouldn't actually call these soft factors, but less certainly less important than, than, than the net returns in our framework were you know, the, the quality of communication uh, the, uh, and timeliness of communication, data quality, um, governance, things like this, which, you know, I think says a lot about the, the, the relative uh, weight we're giving to those factors, because this was a focus, this, this initiative, on schemes where TPR, FCA and DWP know there are very poor levels of governance in a, a large number of those schemes. And still, we felt the net returns was the most important. So I think that's what you know, going forward, I think that's going to form part of our core framework increasingly, where the levels of governance might even be better. Um, we'll steer even more towards a focus on net returns, uh, investment performance, less of costs and charges, uh, which I would say call your core definition, or at least your, your initial definition of value for money. Some of the feedback we've we've been getting on that is that um, that makes sense, given it's the easiest thing to measure, I guess. So one, so a lot of the feedback we had at the time of the VFM assessments was, you know, we have a really good offer in terms of our engagement with members. How do we, you know, feed that into the report and quantify that? Well, uh, that, that's there's certainly a place for that in, in the assessments. But if you um, have a nice app, which some of your members engage with, or, um, you know, you have a lot of questions from very engaged members on ESG, for example, but ultimately the net returns of the scheme are much worse than Master Trust, um, who potentially have less engagement than that. that is a type of scheme that we would look to intervene and, and we'd hope that TPR would intervene if that scheme continued to determine it had value for money. So I think it's about relative weight. And then the softer factors, which we've spoken about recently in our call for evidence on consolidation, were more cultural factors. So where single employer trust persists because they believe it's nice culturally to have a pension scheme, uh, which is run by employees and is part of the, the benefits offer, but that that scheme is underperforming, then that's not something that should stand in the way of, of, of wind up and moving members elsewhere. Um, so, so not necessarily soft effects, I guess, but just the relative weight that we place on those factors, hopefully, um, is, is clear. Uh, I, I think one of the confusions that's entered into the argument is about what your objective is, because your your paper talks about improving member outcomes, but. Now, if you talk to a lot of people, they say, oh, what the DWP is really trying to do is build Britain back better. And that they're actually uh, uh, trying to uh, implement the um, campaign from the Prime Minister and the Treasury to uh, increase the amount of um, private in, um, equity and private debt in, in uh, workplace pension defaults. 
do do you feel that these two things are um, separate agendas? Are they the same? And are you being misunderstood in what you're trying to do? I, I guess I, I'm saying, are you being tweaked by the Treasury or are you your own men? <laughs> um, I, I, I think well, you teed me up very nicely there um, with, with no Treasury colleagues on the call. Uh, so I, I think that we, um, I wouldn't see those things as separate, no. So I think that our, our underlying objective, which I think is quite clear from all of our papers and then even the names of the papers that we put out, is about improving member outcomes and ensuring that members can get the best possible return for their saving. And I think we, what we're trying to assess is, is, is about timing. So here we are nine years after automatic enrolment. And I think we, and that's government, we very aligned on this, are looking at the way that DC schemes are investing and thinking about how that might transform going forward for the betterment of members. So the 80-20 the, the, the equity um, debt split that exists within in schemes at the moment, maybe that isn't, and this is conversation with industry rather than a diktat, the right balance going forward and there's a place for liquid assets as, as schemes get scale and we develop further into um into a a, a bigger and and a more stable a market um so those things are those things are linked i think just to, just on the point of build back better or leveling up and, and and things like that and the role that pensions can play in those um again you know there is no point where I've had a policy discussion in DWP or with Treasury, really, where we've thought, you know, let's make sure that this money is invested in a way that helps the UK economy and plugs gaps in the Treasury's balance sheet. That's not conversations we've ever had. Um, the, the conversation starts from a point of uh, where do the market failures exist in the investment strategies of DC schemes and how can we um, nudge, uh, introduce regulations, introduce guidance to help trustees who are talking to us and saying to us, we want to introduce a liquid assets for the benefit of our members. DWP, TPR, FCA help us with, with overcoming those barriers. So I, I don't feel like we're forcing this down the throats of, uh, of DC trustees. It's our role is to remove the barriers where they believe it's in the betterment of, for the betterment of uh, member outcomes. Well, that, I mean, that leads me interesting into a question for Lou. Lou. You know, let's say that one of these um, failing DC schemes um, decides they want to continue as a DC scheme despite the fact that they're failing on all the, the criteria which they've been asked to report on. I mean, what, what powers have you got to actually force them to hand over the keys to the master trust? Yeah, so I think I think the first the first point would be to actually establish whether whether it's realistic or not. So actually, if they're failing across the piece and they're saying, you know, that what they want to what they want to do is actually carry on, then we would need to see kind of clear plans from them about how they actually intend to get to a space um, where they're able to um, able to offer value for money. Um, and to um, to successfully, you know, pass that um, that value for money assessments and so those plans would need to be realistic so I think one thing that um, uh, will be um, well that we're, we're actively um, thinking about is how where schemes do report to us that they have passed the value for money assessment and that they think you know they can carry on um, how we actually uh, scrutinize that I mean obviously we we can't um, look at every single value for money assessment that's done but we'll need to we'll need to um, find ways of of finding of finding those um, instances where where we need to we need to scrutinize a bit further um, I mean if, if they if, if they failed their value for money assessment um, and they basically don't have any intention of making improvements then there's quite a lot we can do there to direct them to improve and ultimately you know we do have um, the power to di direct a wind up, but that is a fairly nuclear option and a fairly high bar to meet. Um, so we would we would, you know, work with work with the trustees in the first instance to um, to try and get them to take a, a different course of action, so that that, that so that ultimate um, ultimate thing wouldn't be necessary. Um, so yeah, we, it's about it's about using our using the toolkit um, that we have got, you know, um, and equally, you know, where where a scheme does decide that actually it is going to, you know, it has failed, and so it tells us that it intends to wind up. Equally, we need to make sure that that is actually what happens. Um, so we'll be using, you know, our, our regulatory toolkit, so things like um, regulatory initiatives, thematic reviews, and things to actually um, look at what is going on, um, how are people responding, what are the what. How are they responding um, based on the findings of their value for money assessments? So there's a range of tools that we can use, and it's not all going to be about enforcement. You know, we we have a much broader toolkit than just enforcement. 
It's, a, it's fascinating. I'm sure you're considering uh, just how uh, you're going to ensure that members don't lose out in these transitions, because of course there's huge potential detriments if these transitions are done badly. Um, but perhaps we, we can have a question, or one, one or two questions on that later on. Um, I, I wanted to come to Cosmo because uh, the IGCs have been quite uh, up in arms about the FCA um, requiring them to compare uh, what they don't really understand is this concept of the employer scheme, which you they say you you kind of uh, fausted upon them. Um, do it's, it's been quite well known that there's been a lot of contention in this area. Do you think that you've you, you've won that war, or and do you think that members uh, so employer schemes uh, are is a useful way of looking at, uh, at things. And, and has this kind of idea of um, employer scheme charges and the banding actually led to uh, be better positions for employers and indeed for members? Um, so on the question of uh, are we at war with the IGCs, I, I hope not. I mean, we usually have quite robust discussions, but um, uh, I think, you know, I don't think it was ever a case that all of the IGCs disagree with our position. Uh, I think there's a mixed kind of set of views on that. Um, I mean, our position, um, you know, is that despite, I mean, I'm perfectly happy to admit, as I have to them, that, you know, there was some ambiguity in the way the rules you know, could be read. And so, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, that they didn't have a point in the sort of saying, well, actually, you know, we read relevant scheme to mean HMRC level scheme. But I think our, our position from a policy perspective is that, you know, comparing one HMRC scheme, which might have, you know, several hundreds or even thousands or tens of thousands of employers underneath it with another one doesn't really give you a meaningful comparison from the perspective of, you know, the employers and then the ultimate members, um, because each of those employers will have a different set of um, charges applied to effectively, the, you know, the same or a similar product. And so... We think that the you know the meaningful comparison has to happen at that employer level ultimately. Um, but what we have said as well is that you know, given that the larger um, the larger contract based provider you know have you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of employers or customers, you know we are but we are backing a kind of cohort based analysis. Um, which you know the IGC has been working on for some time. We don't want to get in the way of that. Because um, we think, you know, comparing cohorts of, of like schemes on various metrics is a useful place to start at least. Um, but what we're not giving up on is that if you spot outliers within your population at the individual employer level, that it's your job as the IGC to challenge that with the firm. And if you don't get away with the firm, you ultimately, you know, you, you have at your disposal, you know, raising that with the FCA, um, raising that with the individual employers. Um, you know, and IGCs have done that. They have raised it with us in the past. They have written to employers, have written to members. And so I think, you know, that's the kind of challenge that IGCs, I think we expect IGCs to make. Um, yeah, and I think it is at that employer level that we think um, that that challenge ought to be done rather than at the, the kind of higher level aggregate level. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 I have seen examples of, uh, you know, people picking up on what's in the IGC reports and actually using that information to renegotiate charges. So I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that kind of thing creeping in. I think it's, 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 it's very helpful. Uh, and it, it, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who's able to comment on this, uh, any of the consultants or whatever. Maybe it's a bit too early to tell. Um, okay. Uh, I have a question for... Um, Louise, um, do you think there is any real advantage for single employer schemes anymore? Uh, or, or do you think that we're going to see ultimately a, a, a total uh, renunciation of the idea of the employer-sponsored scheme and, and a movement to multi-employer for everything? Um. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we'll see kind of complete um, elimination of single of single employer trusts. But um, I think you know it, it, it. Essentially, it's going to be which ones are able to kind of compete 
um, on the value offering. Um, and so I think in practice, what that means is that it will be the very largest ones where it makes sense for them to um, to continue on that basis. Um, because it's about the resources um, that they have available, um, the kind of level of um, capability and expertise that they're able to get um, on their on their trustee board, you know, uh, the the um, ability that they have to negotiate the, the best deals with providers and things. So um, um, and also to influence things like, you know, ESG on, on, on ESG issues, for example. And, uh, you know, evidence kind of shows that typically it's, it's at the larger end of the market where those kinds of things are, are really possible. So um, I think, you know, the view is that for the majority of employers in the long run, a, a master trust or similar is likely to be um, the best option. Um, and, you know, we have also seen um, a, a trend of actually quite large, um, quite large employers moving from single trust into master trust as well, um, because it makes, you know, um, it, it makes the most sense for them. Um, and they're realising that actually they're, they're maybe not able to um, offer the same for, um, for similar costs. And this is in a situation, you know, with um, particularly with single employer trust, where, where sometimes, you know, it's the employer that does actually uh, meet a lot of the cost, but they're, they're making an economic decision that um, that master trusts are actually uh, better, better for the savers and better, better for them as well. I mean, there, there are also, you know, other other things to consider, like, um, you know, what uh, what role might um, CDCs play, for example? So actually, you know, is that is that a model that's, that might cause um, some um single trust uh, db schemes who might otherwise have looked to um maybe switch into a master trust there are other options that you know may become available to them through some of the new models but i think we will be moving to a place where the majority of employers will be participating in multi-employer schemes i think it, it's very interesting <laughs> it's very um we uh, perhaps i can direct this to andrew because we started with 10 million pound schemes and now we're at 100 million pound schemes, that's where the bar sets. But you've now introduced this idea of the 5 billion pound scheme. I mean, where will it end? What, what, at what point do you, do you concede the cutoff uh, with regard to uh, consolidation? So I think, yeah, we, you, you're right, Tyler, that we've gone from 10 to 100 in, our, in between our consultations. And now we've suddenly skipped a whole few stages and gone straight to 5 billion. <laughs> Um, I, I think those aren't, that's, that's not the definition of a scheme below which we are targeting. I don't think that, that, that that's how I would characterise it. We have come to the conclusion over a few consultations now that the size of a scheme that we want to be aiming for that can do the things that we believe are central to driving a value for member offer forward is about 5 billion. So schemes below that, of which obviously there are loads of single employed trusts, uh, but also a number of master trusts as well um, need to start to to, to, to consider um, uh, how they can achieve those things and investment in a diverse range of assets uh, being being probably number one without without that without that scale obviously there are ways to do it um, co-investment and, and and such but um, that's where we really see those benefits those kicking in really the, the peak economies of scale um, I just wanted to pick up on you know that the role of single employer trusts specifically, because I think this is something that we've spoken about and it's, uh, in our call for evidence and, and other papers, and it's something I mentioned earlier. I think w w one of the things, so our role obviously as EWP is to think about how the market works and how the market interacts uh, with other markets and, 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 and how we can make the market more efficient uh, for members. That's our, that's our policy objective. I think the single employer trust, the thing I, I think I struggle with is uh, the lack of competition and, and what that means for their consideration of value for money. So if you're a master trust you've been competing for the past 10 years and in some cases less in most on charges trying to drive down charges and really thinking about how you can get the best value out of uh, the, the low number of basis points which you're able to afford investments for and that has driven a real as you can i think you can see from the data uh turnaround in in net returns which has been very beneficial for members single employer trusts obviously aren't necessarily competing in the same way against one another on on charges so it's not particularly it's not really a market so the way that 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 impacts uh members i think is something we, we are keeping an eye on i guess but you know some of the best returning schemes in terms of net returns are also single employer trust so it, it, it that, that's not trying to paint them all with the same brush i guess um but certainly some of the some of the 
um, single employer trusts, uh, you know, relying on the fact that they have paternalism or, or greater control over the scheme when their net returns are have, have consistently been subpar it is a concern for us. Well, there are some employers in the audience and uh, there are some trustees of uh, single occupational schemes there. And I noticed that Gurma Care, who I think runs the, uh, is the chair of the trustees at Centrica, uh, has made some quite pertinent comments on this. Uh, Gurma, do you want to un, uh, unmute yourself and make those comments personally or would you like me to read them out? No, I'm happy to yeah. cover it, Henry. In fact, I want to just pick up Andrew on the last comment. I, I do think that, I know this is generalization, but single employer trusts by and large are advised uh, and in most cases, you know, pretty well advised. And I think as trustees and as a trustee of these schemes, you know, it's incumbent on us to look at this on a periodic basis and we do value test. We do look at the marketplace. Uh, okay, we may not compare ourselves to other schemes, but we look at the marketplace um, in terms of if we move to someone else what kind of offering proposition might we get, not just charges, but fund design. And then having done that, we then share the results back with the incumbent provider on a transparent basis, no name, but transparent basis, and look for them to justify what they're offering and where they can offer improvements. And I certainly have two very good examples where having conducted that process, it's improved the member value as a result. So I think it's probably it's probably a generalization to suggest that employ, single employer trusts don't do that because the EBCs who are on this call will all be promoting good practice uh, amongst their clients. Uh, the only other point I want to make, Henry, which was on value for money, it's one of my early comments. Value for money assessments, whether they are carried out by IGCs um, or whether they're carried out at, at single employer schemes or even master trusts, and I participate in all three of those uh, brackets, the areas that they consider tend to be fairly consistent. Charges, fund design, communication, support, admin, et cetera. They're, they're, they're pretty vanilla, the assessments. But the one linkage in my view that's missing is a linkage between the, the outcome, i.e. the investment returns and the charges, some kind of net overview. That's a bit that's missing. Uh, and I think that's probably an area where we need to explore and see what we can do. Yeah, I mean, it's very much what net performance is about, isn't it? But uh... Is it, you know, in your opinion, do the net performance tables uh, overcomplicate matters? Are they workable? I mean, has anyone got a view on that uh, out in the audience? They certainly, see, they certainly look very hard to me. I know Ian Nichols has made a point on this. Uh, would you like to comment, Ian? Ian? Uh, you're on mute. Um yeah, um, not not particularly, Henry. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm just curious because, as we all know, net returns you can measure them over various different periods, um, and we all know that you can look one month and it looks pretty bad, and then two months later it looks much better. So I just was interested for some views on on what's a what's a sensible period because um, it feels that a lot of this is going to drive very short term assessments and decisions and I'm not sure that's always helpful. If I, I mean, I'll put that to you Andrew. I, is, is there a danger that the net performance tables will simply be manipulated and, uh, and used for uh, short termism? I'd hope not. I think within our statutory guidance which accompanies the rules that kicked in a few weeks ago to require all schemes to publish net returns, you know, we are encouraging uh, schemes to publish that over several different time periods. So I think, uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, I think it's 1, 5, 10, and 20. So that kind of, um, that level of different data split in that different way will hopefully help schemes to to, to, to make a more holistic assessment. So where you have maybe uh, a scheme that's, especially single employer trust linking to government's question uh, point, you know, that have been performing badly over 10 or 20 years or, or sub, below a benchmark on net returns, um, then those are that, those are the kind of areas where that would hopefully uh, come through. I, 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 we wouldn't want, you know, we think it's important for our schemes to be publishing the one year net return figure. Um, I think it's important that, that the members start to, uh, if they are interested, see more about the net returns of, of the scheme um, and they deserve to have that information in the name of transparency. But I don't think that should be driving the decision making of 
the the trustees of the scheme um, that 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 you need to look on a much longer uh, basis. And obviously, if they're that the 20 year, 10 year mark returns are looking poor, then that that's um, that's, that's probably fatal. Uh, Rustin, I see you've got your hand up. Was it a comment on this or something else? There is a comment on that, actually. Thanks, Henry. So I agree with, with Andrew. I think I think it's important to disclose that over the long, you know, long time horizons, because obviously we don't want any kind of short termism. But also what I would hope is that it drives the right behaviours in trustee boardrooms by you know, looking at the existing strategy and, and looking at all the different elements, the products that you've got on the platform and looking at future expected return, the volatility, the future net risk adjusted return and to have an audit trail so that when you make an adjustment to the strategy, you know what it is, but you also know the impact overall and also the contrib contribution that is making to that strategy. And in fact, you know, as you know, Henry, Tesco, um, we use dual layer governance because we use a master trust, even though we're a big scheme with over two and a half billion and hundreds of thousands of members. And we have our own strategy, but it's managed by the master trust. You know, they have the ultimate legal obligation. But that's the discipline that we have. And we have advisors to advise us, as well as um, obviously the, the trustee board of the master trust having their own advisors. I mean, this is really important. This is our people's money. So we want to make sure we do the right thing. But I think, so two things, I think just to answer an earlier question, I think even though you've got scale, you can have even greater governance and the benefit of scale by joining a mass trust. That's the first thing. But second, to go back to Andrew's point, I think that, you know, to have that transparency over the returns, net of those costs, and also to understand the impact of the future expected returns has to be a good thing. And if you go back to DB land, of course, when trustees look at this stuff, that's exactly what they do look at. Thank you for that. On the, there, there is a, a complimentary comment, uh, which is coming from Margaret Snowden. Um, and I think saying that for most employers in multi-employer trusts, uh, they're totally disengaged. Do, do you want to pick up on that, Margaret? Are you on the call? So I'm sorry to call people out like this. It's, it's very rude because they may well have gone off for a cup of tea. I'll come back in a second, Margaret. Um, I, I was very interested um, in Diane Day's comment. I know, Diane, you're uh, involved in a couple of uh, uh, IGCs and master trusts and very involved in, in it as, as, as a trustee. Um, and you, you, your question is, will master trusts become so large that they are too big to fail, regardless of poor VFM? Um, I think we, we're going to show at the end of this some, some information which suggests that not all master trusts are actually delivering tremendous value for money at the moment. Um, you know, would anyone like to comment about this, this business of, you know, the master trust has uh, too big, pot potentially too big to fail, that they won't deliver the value, they'll just simply uh, eat everyone else up. Uh, perhaps I could put that to, uh, to Louise. Yeah, um, and actually, I'm probably going to echo because I see, you know, Adrian um, made a, Adrian Bolding made a comment in the side, but actually, you know, part of that is the reason for the master trust authorization regime, and a key requirement is for um, every master trust in order to be authorized has to have a robust continuity plan um, that sets out, you know, how they would exit the market in an orderly fashion. Um, and, and there are protections in place to um, to facilitate that. And that's something that, you know, it's not a standalone thing, something that happens when um, when a master trust is first authorised. They, you know, they need to um, keep that up to date as their business grows, whether they're staying on track with their with their projected business plans or not. That, you know, that strategy will need to be adapted along the way. And it's precisely to guard um, against that risk of their of, of being in a situation uh, where there could be um, a disorderly exit of a master trust from the marketplace, because obviously that could have, um, a, a, you know, impact on millions of savers. So that's that's why that's there. Um, I, I saw you took yourself off. Oh, yeah. um, yeah. Diane. Do you want to say something in return? Yeah, I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on the value for money um, issue in that, not the failure, really, to say uh, and maybe failure was not the right um, description, but what I want to guard against, I suppose, is, is master trusts continuing because they are large, but continuing not to provide value for money. So in a relative investment performance league table world, there will always, by definition, be 
a master trust at the bottom. And um, that doesn't stop master trusts providing um, poor value for money for several years for members. And I just wondered what the, the regulator would do about that, um, about that scenario. Yeah, we kind of don't have a relegation zone, do we? <laughs> no, <laughs> you can't be on the bench. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting. So, so I mean, is, is there a point where the, the, the regulator would turn on the master trust and say, you're just not delivering the goods, guys? Well, I think, you know, I think this is this is the um, advantage of the kind of consistent metrics framework that we're looking to get in place is that we'll be able to see see that very easily, as will as will, you know, the rest of the rest of the market. And um, if there is a master trust that is consistently um, underperforming, you know, relative relative to others, um, then that would form a basis of a conversation as to actually why is that? Are there issues with the governance? What's driving um, what's driving that and, and why why are they consistently underperforming so um, that's you know the kind of framework that we're looking to get in place would would give us exactly that kind of opportunity to do that um, and to do it and to do it you know quickly as well what about faith grounds because there are some of the master trust which is specifically set up for um you know a certain faith you know they the, the, the view that you you wouldn't necessarily want to involve, involve your master, your your members in certain things which might be quite lucrative in terms of returns but won't deliver a lot of value uh, to the members' lives because they'll feel they're invested in the wrong stuff. Uh, is that is that a reasonable reason for underperformance, Louise? Sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think if that if that's something that can be justified on the basis of um, the you know specific requirements of of their savers or or a you know or a um, segment of savers, um, if if there's um, if there's a legitimate reason for that, then uh, then yes, you know, I think um, because there there are some some elements that won't necessarily be um, comparable on the face of it, and, and it's when you. Um, are we having problems with Louise's line or is it with me? Am I, I back? You're back, you're back, right. I'm back, sorry, it just said the meeting disconnected for a minute there. So, um, so, uh, so yes, so, so no, my, my, my point was that, uh, that that would be the basis of a conversation and, and it may well be a legitimate reason in scenarios, in scenarios such as that one. I, I had a worry we had some divine intervention coming in at the point that you were talking about, Faith. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, it, there is a, I, I, I fear, um, a time constraint upon this meeting. We can't go on forever. But I'd like to throw the meeting, re the, the, the meeting out really to those people who haven't said anything yet and who would like to. Has anyone got a comment they'd like to make at the moment on what they've heard or who hasn't as yet had a chance to speak? Put your Ian, hand up. Ian, Ian Costain. Yep, go on, Ian. Ian. Yeah. Off you go. Ian, you're very much involved in the uh, Master Trust world. Oh, sorry, the IGC world. I know you're in on the hard reach of Lansdowne. IGC, is that right? Yes, yeah. yes, I'm uh, an independent member on the Hargreaves Lansdowne IGC, and I've been a independent member of IGCs since they were set up in, in, in 2015. Um, you, you made the comment earlier, Henry, about uh, a kind of misunderstanding, I think, with the uh, the FCA. Uh, I think uh, I just wanted to make the observation that that was just a purely technical matter where we were trying to understand what the the wording within the regulations are. The first point I would make is is that I think IGCs and the FCA are completely aligned. Um, we are both driving for the same thing. We want good outcomes for members, and we want a robust value for money. Uh, framework alongside that. Um, you know, the focus of the FCA, the focus of the IGCs to begin with was very much on charges, and I think that was absolutely right. Um, but as Cosmo said, um, the focus now needs to be on value for money uh, in the round. And, and, and this is the point I want to make, really, which is that in terms of putting a value on the quality of services that are delivered, uh, is vital 
in order to do any value for money assessment at all. Um, it's great to grapple with the data on charges and net returns, but it is um, necessary um, to put a value on the quality of services delivered. And I'd like to give you an example, if I, I may, very quickly, because you know I, I, was, I was a little perturbed with Andrew's comment about these soft factors kind of somehow being less important. Um, I think um, a few years ago, the FCA and TPR published their joint regulatory strategy. And I, for one, applauded the fact that they identified the overarching harm as being people not having adequate income in retirement. This is all about ensuring that consumers have members have adequate income in retirement. Now, I'm an independent member of the Hargreaves Lansdowne IGC, um, and I say this as an independent person because we've scrutinised their workplace financial education programme. Over the last year, they did 400 presentations to over 9,000 attendees, and alongside that, they did 5,000 one-to-one meetings with members of pension schemes. As a result, 50% are contributing more than the minimum contribution. Contributions are the single most important factor um, in ensuring that people have an adequate income in retirement. So the point that I would make um, now as an IGC, you know, we put a significant value on that. Um, Hargreaves Lansdowne charges no doubt come out as higher, but my point is that you cannot do a value for money assessment without putting a value on the quality of the services delivered and to almost dismiss them as being soft issues